Good evening. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the William G. McGowan Theater this evening here at the National Archives, and a special welcome to our viewers on C-SPAN and our own YouTube channel. Tonight's program, Women's History on the Horizon, the Centennial of the Women's Suffrage in 2020, it is presented in commemoration of Women's Equality Day 2014 and the 94th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which granted women the right to vote and forever changed the face of the American electorate. Before we begin the program, I'd like to tell you about two upcoming programs that will take place in this theater. On Thursday, August 28th at 7 p.m., award-winning documentary filmmaker Nancy Bursky will be here to introduce and discuss her latest film, Afternoon of a Fawn, Tanaquil Leclerc. It's the story of a famed prima ballerina whose career was tragically cut short when she contracted polio in her light, late 20s. This program is presented in a partnership with the National Gallery of Art. On Monday, September 8th, at noon, Cass R. Sunstein, the nation's most cited legal scholar, discusses his latest book, Conspiracy Theories and Other Dangerous Ideas, a compilation of his most famous, insightful, and relevant pieces, a book signing policy program. To learn more about these and all of our programs and activities, consult our monthly calendar of events in print or online. There are copies in the lobby as well as a sign-up sheet where you can receive the calendar by regular mail or email. You'll also find brochures about other National Archives programs and events. And another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the Foundation for the National Archives. The Foundation supports all of our work in education and outreach. And there are applications for membership in the lobby. And a little known secret, and if I stop talking about it, it won't be a secret anymore, no one has ever been turned down for membership in the <laughs> Foundation for the National Archives. It was on August 18th, 1920, that the fate of the 19th Amendment was decided. 35 states, one short of what was needed, had ratified it and it came down to the Tennessee legislature. Tennessee's Senate had approved it, but the state house had deadlocked. A young representative named Harry Byrne, who was opposing it, listened carefully to the debate. Then he opened a letter from his mother, who wrote, don't forget to be a good boy and, <laughs> and help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification a reference to Perry Chapman Catt, one of the suffrage leaders. Harry was indeed a good boy and changed his vote to yay, thus ratifying the 19th Amendment. The National Archives holds many textual, graphic, and photographic records related to women's suffrage, including the 19th Amendment itself, as well as petitions in support of suffrage signed by Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Frederick Douglass and even records opposing women's suffrage, including a petition for Mrs. Jane W. Wadsworth, Jr., president of the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage, because, quote, it would be an official endorsement of nagging as a national policy. <laughs> it would give every radical woman the right to believe that she could get any law she wanted passed by pestering her city council, her legislature, her congressman, or her president no matter how the people voted, nor what national crisis existed. And if feminism can be put through by pestering, regardless of the will of the people, so can pacifism, socialism, and other isms." Unquote. Tonight, a distinguished panel will discuss how nearly 100 years of voting rights have had an impact on present-day political, social, and economic roles for women. The panel includes Bridget Howe, Manager of Program Services for Girl Scouts National Capital, Dr. Ida E. Jones, Assistant Curator of Manuscripts at the Moreland Springarn Research Center at Howard University, Cindy Balanick, Louise B. Potter, Senior Director of Site Stewardship at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Dr. Libby O'Connell, Chief Historian for History, formerly the History Channel, and Nancy E. Tate, Executive Director of the League of Women Voters of the United States. Tonight marks the fifth consecutive year the National Archives has presented this Women's Equality Day program in partnership with the Sewell Belmont House and Museum, home of, his, of the historic women, National Women's Party located here in Washington, D.C. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for tonight's discussion, 
and executive director of the Sewell Belmont House, Paige Harrington. Paige brought her passion for women's studies and historic preservation to the role of executive director of the Sewell Belmont House and Museum. Previously, she served as the vice president of operations of the United States Navy Memorial and as architectural historian at the preservation firm of architect Milford Wayne Donaldson. She earned two master's degrees from the University of San Diego, her first in public history and second in nonprofit management and leadership. In addition to her work at Sewell Belmont, Paige serves on the board of directors for the National Collaboration for Women's History Sites. Please welcome Paige Harrington and our panel. Good evening, and thank you so much for that wonderful welcome. And yes, indeed, this is the fifth year that we have had the privilege of being here in this wonderful theater, and we are indeed delighted to celebrate Women's Equality Day with you. Let me say thank you to Tom Nastic. He is the director of programs here, and he always does a fantastic job and makes us feel very welcome. <clears throat> So those of us who work directly in women's history organizations or sites have of course been talking about the centennial anniversary for suffrage in 2020 for many years now. I know that there are several of my colleagues who work at different women's organizations and history sites in the audience here tonight, including those from the Women's History Project, Turning Point Suffrage Memorial, and again, the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites. It's our goal, however, tonight to actually expand the conversation. We hope that this dialogue will be one that not only women's historians have and not only other women's organizations, but that we actually get it into the public mainstream. And hopefully, that will give us an, a chance to once again remind the citizens of this country about the bravery and sacrifice for those women who committed themselves to empowerment and civic engagement for all. The Sewell Belmont House and Museum is located on Capitol Hill, and it is home to the historic National Woman's Party. It is a national landmark and extends an, forgive me, and has an extensive collection of suffrage banners, other documents, papers, and artifacts. The panelists that join me here tonight are all part of broad-reaching, well-respected organizations. The Girl Scouts reached their centennial anniversary just a couple of years ago. The National Woman's Party, my organization, will celebrate our centennial in 2016. The League of Women Voters will celebrate theirs along with the 19th Amendment in 2020. And Howard University predates all of us being founded in 1867. Tonight you will hear from this distinguished panel, not only about their own organizational histories, but also how they're moving the conversation forward looking ahead to upcoming centennial and other anniversaries, and also seeking new partnerships. The National Woman's Party used many effective tactics and strategies during their campaigns for both suffrage and equal rights. One of the most effective was a publication of the weekly magazine, first The Suffragist, and then The Equal Rights. At a high point, the circulation reached over 20,000 and provided critical updates, necessary calls to action, and celebrated many victories for the cause in the days before social media and Twitter, of course. As is the case with any printed collateral material, sometimes you have extra copies. Well, the NWP is no different. In 2003, staff rediscovered hundreds and hundreds of extra copies of the Equal Rights magazines. And it is our goal to be able to redistribute those magazines that were never distributed originally in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and even into the 1960s. By finding new organizations, archives, and other wonderful collaborative partnerships that we can turn ownership of some of those documents over to so that they can reach a whole new generation of researchers. It's taken more than 10 years to get this project off the ground, but I'm happy to say that through a generous grant from our friend Lisa Smith, who is here, I think, in the audience tonight, we have actually started, and today was the first day of our new intern. So I'm excited to tell you that. Thank you. It is our goal that by Women's Equality Day in 2020, we will have redistributed these hundreds of extra copies. So please take a look at our website and look for us on social media as we walk through and try to find new organizations both locally, nationally, and also internationally so that we can share these treasures with them. 
So tonight we have pulled together an outstanding panel for a lively conversation. Women's suffrage, equality, what 100 years of the woman's vote has meant for the economy, for our own organizations, and also for our country. We will start with just introductory remarks from the group, and then I will moderate what I think will be a very lively discussion if we pick up on what we were already talking about backstage. And then we also have the opportunity for questions and comments from the audience. So there's microphones on both sides. You all can queue up. I will give you the high sign when we're about there. And thank you very much, and it's nice to see everyone tonight. All right. Okay. Can we start with you? Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Am I on? I'm on. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Paige, thank you so much for this introduction and for the opportunity to be on this panel. I'm Bridget Howe. I'm the Manager of Program Services at Girl Scouts of the Nation's Capital. We're the largest Girl Scout Council in the country, and we serve about 64,000 girls with 25,000 adult members and volunteers in 25 counties in Maryland, the District of Columbia, Virginia, and West Virginia. Um, we are, I am very lucky to be part of an organization that is so well known. I think everyone has heard of Girl Scouts and such a part of American culture. Quick question, how many in the audience and on the stage were Girl Scouts? Okay. Just as I suspected, the evidence shows that women who are Girl Scouts are more civically engaged as they become adults, and clearly <laughs> that's holding true in this room. Uh, if you were a Girl Scout, though, 20 years ago, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you might not know what we're doing today, so I'd like to share some of that with you. Of course, girls still go camping in Girl Scouts. They're never going to stop going camping because outdoors experiences lay an amazing groundwork for exploring new things and developing valuable skills like teamwork. And I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge probably our most famous program, the Cookie Program. Uh, the Cookie Program is a great way for young women to learn firsthand the ins and outs of running a business. They learn goal setting, they learn decision making, money management, people skills, and I think probably most importantly, they learn business <laughs> ethics and the importance of being ethical in everything they do. And of course, girls still earn badges. Badges have not gone away either. But we are, as an organization, on a, message, on a, excuse me, on a mission to do more than cookies, camping, and crafts. For 102 years, since 1912, Girl Scouts has been the premier leadership organization for girls, and that is still true today. Every experience a girl has in Girl Scouts prepares her to be a leader today and a leader tomorrow. We value civic engagement. We want the girls to value civic engagement, to not only feel comfortable sitting at the table, but to move to the head of the table. We do this by providing fun, high-quality programs that help girls discover their skills, strengths, and values, connect with their communities, and take action to make the world a better place. We have 3.2 million members nationally and over 50 million alumna, so we've definitely reached a lot of girls. 70% of female members of Congress and senators were Girl Scouts, as well as 80% of women business owners. And every female Secretary of State was a Girl Scout. I spent a lot of time thinking about how Girl Scouts relate to the other organizations on this panel and the subject of the panel, and I, I think sharing some of Girl Scouts history would be appropriate. Uh, we were founded by Juliet Gordon Lowe in 1912, and we celebrated our centennial right here in Washington, D.C. two years ago with the world's largest sing-along on the National Mall called Rock the Mall. Uh, if any of you were there, it was a pretty great day, a little bit warm, but a great day. Um, what people might not know is that Girl Scouts actually had its first national headquarters here in Washington, D.C. in the Muncie Building, which was just a couple of blocks down Pennsylvania Avenue where also actually was headquartered the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And I often have just kind of a, because I'm a little bit of a history geek, I often have kind of a little imaginary image of Juliet Gordon Lowe waiting for the elevator and who some of the suffrage leaders might, that she might have run into. Washington has always been a very small town. And the conversations they might have had, um, maybe one day we'll find out. Uh, through its history, Girl Scouts have been known for civic engagement. From our first badge book in 1916 called How Girls Can Serve Their Country, girls have been encouraged to become knowledgeable about government. And in 1916, there was a civics badge available alongside badges like signaling, needlewoman, and laundress. And the requirements were not easy. I don't know that I would earn the badge today. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to name all of them. There were about 15 requirements. But I'm going to share a couple because I thought it was, it gave me a lot of insight into what Juliet Gordon Lowe might have been thinking. Uh, a girl must have been able to recite the preamble to the Constitution to state the chief requirements of citizenship of a voter in her state, territory, or district. And keep in mind, this was in 1916 when girls could not vote nationally. Know how the governor of her state, the lieutenant governor, senators and representatives are elected in their term of office. Know the principal officers in her town and city and how they're elected in their term of office. 
that's an awful lot of emphasis on voting so and civic engagement. There's never been a Girl Scout badge book without a badge that encourages civic engagement. And of course, our promise asks our members to promise to serve their country. Today, we have a series of citizen badges from celebrating community to inside government to behind the ballot in public policy. Locally, we have a program entering its 40th year. Actually, I'm sorry, we just completed our 40th anniversary uh, where girls spend a week on Capitol Hill doing internships on, uh, with members of Congress. And in 40 years, over 1,000 girls have been able to participate in that program. We're also looking to 2016, which will be the 100th anniversary of Girl Scouts' highest award. Uh, in 1916, it was the Golden Eaglet of Merit. Today, it's the Girl Scout Gold Award. And whatever its name, it means that girls have taken action and made the world a better place. But we're also, and I'm winding up here, <laughs> very excited to make sure that Girl Scouts have a seat at the table for the centennial of suffrage. Today's girls have a lot of opportunities, but that means it's all the more important that they know the history. Um, I'm looking forward to generating ideas with my fellow panelists and to look for looking at ways to engage girls in this celebration in six years. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you, Paige, for having me. It's uh, many anniversaries are being celebrated on this week and actually this year. It was four years ago I was here moderating this panel at the 90th of the Women's Suffrage Amendment. And actually this week that just passed was 50 years since the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party met in Atlantic City with Fannie Lou Hamer asserting states' rights or asserting the rights to be represented in Atlantic City. We're also celebrating Paige being six years at the Sewell Belmont home, as well as the Voting Rights Act of 1964. I want to make some comments, but I also want to give you some text to also read as a university representative slash historian. There are some literature that is out there that would be very helpful. Online is a publication called The Black Women in the United States, 2014, Progress and Challenges by the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation, published by the Black Women's Roundtable. And the Progress and Challenges looks at 50 years of the war on poverty, 50 years on the Civil Rights Act, and 60 years versus Brown Board of Education. Two publications that are seminal textbooks, one is entitled, But Some of Us Are Brave, All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, uh, But Some of Us Are Brave by Gloria Hull and others is a seminal work in black women's history. And finally, a colleague of mine, Rosalind Torborg Penn's work, African American Women in the Struggle for the Vote, 1850 to 1920, really helps you understand the struggle for African American women who are at the nexus of both being women and African American are doubly marginalized in light of their participation and membership in both groups. So in light of discussing what we would see in 2020 with regards to the suffrage movement, it had a very rocky start, and we can't ignore that history that there was class divisions as well as race divisions within the suffrage movement. We still have not um, ameliorated all of those issues. They still are amongst us. But for African American women in particular, what I've looked at through the literature seemingly was that black women, once they received the franchise, understood the importance of civic engagement on the basic level. So PTAs, school boards, city councils, and changing policy that would then once again infect education and economics. And that triumvirate of education, politics, and policy still remains very much an issue. In the essay written by Elsie Scott, who's at the Ron Walters chair at Howard University, she talks about Shirley Chisholm and Carol Mosley Braun. Carol Mosley Braun was the only African American woman elected to the Senate in the history of the Senate. And that's almost 20 years ago. And there has not been another black woman in the Senate representing any black woman's interests. And then, of course, Shirley Chisholm made the first campaign in the 20th century for the Democratic nomination to run for the president of the United States. So African-American women understand their politics not just to be racialized or gendered, but civically engaged that all persons, whether they are Latino immigrants, legal or illegal, whether they be working uh, below minimum wage, that all persons have a civic responsibility to be counted as equal. So I think in light of the next six years we're looking at, and the lame duck presidential administration right now, and possibly a female candidate in 2016, there are a lot of issues that we need to really engage beyond the issue of race, but we can't ignore the issue of race. And right now, the issue of race has turned green. It's a matter of poverty, that we have people who are working beneath poverty level, and usually they're women with children, who have been abandoned by husbands and or trying to survive on their own. Coupled with the fact that <clears throat> Most women are now, black women, are facing pr prison terms because they're doing things that are extra legal or illegal to support their families. So writing fraudulent checks, not being able to pay for parking tickets, leads to a snowballing effect that leads to criminal efforts. And at times when you were felony convicted, you could not have any vote, voting rights. So the idea of repealing 
felony conviction so that people can receive their franchise after an imprisonment is a huge issue. So African American women in politics and in civic engagement are really concerned with bread and butter issues. And it's nice to look at health issues such as reproductive rights and other things. But historically, our concern has been to be at the table as citizens educated, employed, econ economically employed with standards of living and being able to see that everyone is entitled to their level of civic responsibility. So I look forward to the conversation. I look forward to sharing with my guest panelists, but it's very important for us to understand the four mothers such as Fannie Lou Hamer, Rosa Parks, and Coretta Scott King, they just recently reissued the uh, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, and by 2013 it was nullified with the Supreme Court decision that took a lot of the teeth out of the new Voting Rights Act. So we're concerned with the ideas of having women candidates in place that can put sensitive Supreme Court justices, governors, senators, and legislators in place to be very broad-minded in their perspective, understanding race, class, and gender as we move into the 21st century in the first half. So thank you. Wonderful. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Paige, for having me. Look forward to the conversation tonight. Um, I'm Cindy Malinick. I work at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which is celebrating its 65th um, birthday this year, founded in 1949 congressionally chartered um, with a twofold um, purpose. One was to kick off the historic preservation movement, although um, as a history nerd and geek myself, um, you know, I, I'm not sure how, much, how, many you, how many of you all know that the historic preservation movement in the United States was, of course, started by a woman mm -hmm. uh, at Mount Vernon, and women continue to, um, to, to, lead, the, to lead that movement. Um, including in our own organization where we have the first, um, we've had our first female CEO who was appointed in 2010. So that was happy news to, to many of us. I've watched, um, I've been at the Trust for a dozen years in a variety of positions, and I've watched um, particularly um, the last few years uh, women also move into um, executive roles and certainly um, at our historic sites which is what I do at the National Trust. Um, I am, am pleased to, to serve as the deputy and um, chief of staff for uh, the senior vice president and um, of the Historic Sites Department. And our role um, at headquarters is to work with our historic sites. It's a national nationwide portfolio that spans the country small. It's about 25 sites, but encompasses 4,000 acres, several hundred roof structures, 60,000 objects, and perhaps most importantly, um, core stories of, um, of Americans and American history. What we've been working on, particularly the last few years, is to start to share the, the core stories, peel back the, the, uh, the onion, so to speak, of, of those people that um, have been marginalized, certainly. Uh, people of color and certainly women, but we also all know that at every historic site there are women's stories. Um, certainly the National Trust acquired many of their sites as gifts, often many times they were gifts from women, but they've often focused on, on men um, and um, that's been part of the push to start to share stories in, an, in, a, in a setting that often um, many people don't see themselves reflected, and they certain women have not seen themselves reflected um, as of late. But many of our sites, and I wanted to tell you about two or three of them, are working um, diligently to start to share those stories so that when visitors come, when they visit websites, they actually, and women in particular, see themselves. Um, when a, my first job at the National Trust was uh, to serve as the executive director of the Decatur House, which is here in Washington on Lafayette Square. And Stephen Decatur, as it was called when I first got there. Um, so we started talking about Susan immediately, his wife, who um, you know, had to take care of things after he was killed in a duel some 11 months later. So he, he, he was not interesting that his name Stephen Decatur, and he lived there about 11 months. But the most important um, part of that site, I, I think, and, and, and the work that I'm most proud of was to start to share the story of the slave quarters. So there is a slave quarters on the site. It's the um, only remaining physical evidence that human beings were held in bondage inside of the White House. And perhaps one of the most compelling stories that we began telling at that site was the story of Lottie Dupuy, Charlotte Dupuy, who was enslaved there by then Secretary of State Henry Clay. And um, what did she do? But she sued for her freedom in 1829. I love the story. She did not uh, ultimately prevail. But um, it's an amazing story of strength and resilience and 
that site and that building in particular and the stories that we started to unearth as we started to research about people of color, people enslaved, women, um, are amazing and they resonate with um, many of the people that and students that visit. Other sites that are um, that ha that have a women a woman's focus or that we're we're starting to focus more on that are our glass box located outside of Chicago, the Farnsworth <laughs> House in Plano. Um, it's probably most known for um, its its architect Mies van der Rohe. It's kind of an outsized personality, but who commissioned him? But Dr. Edith Farnsworth, a nephrologist, um, uh, Chicago, out of Chicago. So that's a for those of you that. Are, that don't know, that's a, a doctor that focuses on the kidneys. They had um, perhaps a tempestuous relationship, but she was intimately involved in, in the building of her summer retreat as a single woman to make her way out to Chicago, out, out of Chicago. It, it's easily an hour by car now, so longer in 1949. Um, and to, to travel out there and work with such a famed architect um, was, is quite something. So um, the, the new executive director there is working to start to share her story more. I'll also just mention one more and then pass it off. So also in Washington, D.C. is our, our site, the president was Wilson, uh, Woodrow Wilson House, um, which many of you can imagine that uh, the president, no, the president had um, perhaps a fraught, maybe is, a, is one way of putting it, relationship with, with women and came to see the came to see the light when he, when he finally um, supported uh, suffrage. Um, I will say that, you know, the, that site and, and that director and, and has worked, you know, especially with Paige, is, is open and wants to start to talk more about, about that, about that time in our history. And, you know, these places that, um, that encompass these stories, that, 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 that embody tension, that embody you know what's human about us. These are these are places that set up a framework for, for education and that, and that opening, um, that un, you know peeling back the peeling back the layers, lifting up the veil is is how we um, acknowledge the past and how we uh, embrace the future and and think about how we're going to move forward. So at all of our sites across the country, we are focusing on. Um, on the on those stories that are those core stories that are embodied at those places, and those are just three examples. Happy to talk about more of that as we go along tonight. Um, I'm Dr. Libby O'Connell. I'm the chief historian at the History Channel, which is part of A and E Networks. I'm also a commissioner of the United States um, Centennial Commission on World War One which is a great honor for me to do. But that means that I'm very familiar with the Woodrow Wilson House. Um, and the themes of World War I are those that we encounter when we're studying women's history because it was an era of great change. And so it's particularly um, an honor to be here tonight. I want to thank the National Archives for hosting this. And I want to thank um, Paige. Um, Harrington at Sewell Belmont House for inviting me to, um, because both of the hats that I wear today are really entwined um, in the issue of women's voting. The History Channel was begun almost 20 years ago. It, it is part of a group of networks, a media company called A&E Networks. One of the, our major networks is A&E, the other one is History, and the third one is Lifetime. Lifetime's no longer using this tagline, but once it was called the Network for Women. Um, today, it still does a lot of work in women's issues, and it proudly supports a campaign called Your Life, Your Time, Your Vote. And they've done some work with the uh, League of Women's Voters, and they're very engaged. We are very engaged in getting women um, using our airtime, which is an important attribute of a, of a TV company using our airtime to encourage women to register and to get out and vote. And it's been embraced by both sides of the um, political um, fence, so we're happy to get that support. Um, and, and working at the History Channel, all of those, those three networks are, we call, <clears throat> you got to love the modesty of the cable industry, we are universally distributed. That means that um, we're in, each of those networks are in about 100 million homes 
uh, in the United States. And then we're in about 100, History Channel is in 150 countries worldwide. Um, largely, we tell on the History Channel stories uh, that appeal to a male audience. That is what our assignment is. And it's like, this is the brother channel, and Lifetime is the sister channel. I'm not kidding. And um, so the goal of Lifetime is to reach 60% women, and the goal of um, History Channel is to reach 60% male. So those programming goals and attributes are very different, but they are parallel. One of the joys of my life is that I get to work outside of the television nightly rating system by coordinating with historic sites, by coordinating with people um, at museums, working with organizations like the National Archives. We're doing a, um, some programming videos. We're donating to the National Archives for an exhibit they have coming up on the history of booze in America. It's called the Spirited Republic. I'm sure it's going to be great. I'm very excited about that. Um, we also did a short film for um, Sewell Belmont House talking about the National Women's Party. I also do work for the Smithsonian, producing short form there, and the National Park Service at places like Gettysburg or um, at other public air, um, sites like Mount Vernon. But one of the thing that, things that intrigues me the most is the confluence of place and memory, and how when you go to an historic site or you go to a certain place in history, you get a very strong sense of the past. And by talking to people who work there, the experts in the field, but also the families and the, and the um, elders who have a story to tell, to share. It really brings a vibrancy and a sense of vivid connection that we should all be involved in, in sharing those conversations. And I'm just going to bring up, up one, because I went to graduate school at the University of Virginia from my perspective, not that long ago. But for many of you here, it was a long time ago. But it was in the 70s. And my husband, my boyfriend, he was very cute. <laughs> we got married. But at the time, <laughs> we were just dating. And he was at law school. And I would go over to the law school. And, and the women's bathrooms had urinals in them because they had not expected women to ever be at the, at the law school except the guests. And the bathroom upstairs, there was one women's bathroom upstairs that said ladies, right? And then downstairs, there were hardly, there were, the, the bathrooms for women were all for men. And this building had been built in the 60s, not 1860s, 1960s. They never expected women to go to law school. And I tell that to people my daughter's age today, and they go, really? You lived during that time? <laughs> And, and my experiences are just um, small compared to others. So I encourage you all to get involved in this conversation about women's equal rights, because we all have stories, no matter how old we are and how we participated. Well, thank you to Paige and all my fellow panelists and to the archives. Uh, women's suffrage, of course, is a, a central theme, a dearly beloved topic at the League of Women Voters. We were founded, I'm Nancy Tate, I'm the executive director of the League of Women Voters of the United States. The League was founded in February 1920, which was seven months before the amendment was ratified. They weren't even sure that it would be ratified at that point. We were founded by Carrie Chapman Catt, who the archivist mentioned, who was the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And it was founded to do two things. The first premise was, because women had never voted, how would they, they were not knowledgeable about the issues. How could they be informed and active members of society without knowing the issues? So we were founded to help with that education process. But secondly, one of the, uh, the goals was to continue the fight. And of course, it was not the fight about women's suffrage specifically, but more broadly, over time, it's been for political equality primarily in the United States, but not limited to the United States. So what is the League of Women Voters today? We are a national grassroots organization. We are a membership organization. And we operate at the three levels of government. So I'm at the National League. There are 50 state leagues, plus the District of Columbia, and over 700 local leagues. 
almost all the work that is done by the state and local leagues are done by our members who are predominantly volunteers. So there are people like all of you who are active civically in their community doing a variety of things. We continue in different ways to focus on those two original goals of education and advocacy. We believe that participation in the political process is fundamentally important and it's important for everybody's voice to be included. But we do this in a nonpartisan way. And nonpartisan means that we don't endorse or support candidates or parties in any way. But it does not mean that we don't take a position on issues that are dear to us, which usually relate to improving the political process. So our goals are full enfranchisement and political equality and while we're doing that, we are encouraging all Americans to be active themselves and to make their voice heard. So another characteristic of the League is that we don't give up. So some of these issues we've been working on for over 50 years. Those of you who live in the District of Columbia know that voting rights for the district is a long, a, a rock that we've been trying to push up that hill for a long time and we're gonna keep at it. But to quote an early League leader, the success of democracy does not depend on a few persons doing great things, but on many persons doing small things faithfully. And that pretty much sums up the League's philosophy. So over these last 94 years, we have, as I said, been doing both education and advocacy. Local Leagues actually educate the community on any number of issues. They try to have both sides of a complex situation, be it sprawl or, um, their education system, but of course we're best known in the elections area. So leagues are very active in explaining to people how to register to vote, when to register to vote, actually helping them register to vote. We're well known for, for doing what we call voter guides, which are often printed in newspapers, they're frequently online now, which explain who's running for every race and what their positions are. And of course we have done a lot and continue to do a lot of candidate debates. Uh, many of you know that we are well, well known for doing the presidential debates, which we did in the 1970s and 1980s, until the political parties uh, actually became uncomfortable with us playing that role because they saw us as too independent, and they have now turned it over to the Commission on Presidential Debates. Most recently, we have uh, created an uh, online um, one-stop shop on election information, which we call vote411.org. I put some cards out in the lobby about that. That explains all the laws in all the states because the states vary significantly in their election laws. It also has a polling place lookup for everybody as well as candidate information. So for us, 2020 is doubly significant because it represents two anniversaries. Suffrage, which is our history in our background, and it's, it's a great partnership to work with Paige who actually has a building and artifacts. We don't have any of that, but we have the real people who are the, the children, the grandchildren, the descendants of all the, the women who, and men who work so hard for suffrage. So we hope to partner with many organizations, with various museums, with many women's organizations who are pushing for particular, particularly different types of fuller equality for women, economic, pay equity, reproductive rights, and so forth. Um, but we're also, of course, going to focus on our own history. And we're going to do this basically in three ways, although our plans are just evolving. One is to highlight parts of our own history in each of the next five years leading up to 2020. So that we don't have to wait till one magic year where you try to tell your whole history uh, in, in the blink of an eye. But for instance, uh, 2015, is the 70th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations. That's significant to the League because the League lobbied in the 1930s and the 1940s for a variety of international peace treaties and for the founding of the United Nations. We were present at the signing of the UN Charter in San Francisco and we continue to have official observer status there. Several of our New York and New Jersey members go weekly and are very active in a lot of the uh, related organizations. Presidential debates keep coming up. People keep asking us to take back the debates. Um, you can't take back the debates if the parties won't come. So uh, <laughs> it's hard to have a debate when nobody's there, but we continue to look for ways to actually make it easier for the public to watch debates 
in a sort of critical thinking uh, style because we all know when we observe these that it's hard to actually figure out oftentimes what these people are saying. Um, a second theme will be encouraging our local leagues to tell their own stories and their own histories and how they have impacted and made their own communities better. I happen to belong to the Arlington, Virginia League, and I know that the Arlington League was very, um, played an important part in the integration of the first school uh, in Virginia uh, after uh, Brown versus the Board of Education. And the Arlington League was working with the schools and those African American families. So our theme overall when we're doing this, of course, is to highlight parts of our history so we continue to tell our story now, even though everything that we do in these communities is not always, of course, as momentous as, as passing the 19th Amendment was. And the final thing that we will plan to do is, is basically some self-reflection and assessment uh, about our internal processes, our uses of technology, uh, to try to ensure that we will be as vibrant and effective in the next hundred years uh, as we have been to date. So I haven't gotten the hook yet, but I'm going to stop uh, anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. How, are we okay on time? We're fine. So one of the things that I've noticed, if you want to talk about a common theme with all of us, is that we're all um, certainly sitting up here professional women. We've all been trained, we've all gone to school for numerous, numerous years, and we've all chosen our respective professions. So women's organizations, academia, historic preservation, television and cable TV, and of course civic engagement, and then um, museums. So maybe we could take a minute and go just very quickly through and talk a little bit about what drew you as a professional woman, what drew you to the area that you're in now, and was there anything specifically that you think has changed, perhaps, over the course of your career that has now made it easier for you to help younger women and these new emerging professional women come to the forefront? So, for instance, historic preservation. Cindy, you mentioned, not to put you on the spot, but you mentioned that the first president and CEO of the National Trust is, of course, a woman, Stephanie Meeks. And we were all very happy to see her appointed just a, couple of, just a few years ago now. So maybe you could talk a little bit about historic preservation. And are you seeing a lot of changes, not only from the site level, but also to the National Trust level, the larger level? And how do you think that's impacted your career and others that are coming after you? Wow. Um, well, I, I mean, I was drawn to the field. I, you know, I, sometimes I feel it's a little sacrilegious. I'm not sure how much of a historic preservationist I am as much as I am a, um, you know, someone who loves stories and memory. I do love architecture. I will say that I love to study. I love to study and think about architecture. But these places, you know, there's a, you know, these places are, are powerful. They hold stories that, um, whether it's your, you know, your your grandmother's kitchen or it's Mount Vernon or any, you know, everything and and in between, um, they they reflect who we who we are and and they're places where we can learn more about ourselves. So that's, I think, mm -hmm. what drew me to the field. Um, and I certainly, as I mentioned, have seen women, and, and I think it's, it's, it's the same as, as law school, as, you know, as any of these fields, you know, as women were able to start to go to graduate school, go, go to school and start to um, kind of dip their big toe in the water, just by hook or by crook, we've been able to just kind of make our way, make, make our way through. But certainly, um, you know, any young woman that comes to me, I'm, I'm very excited to talk to them and, and, and be helpful in any way I can. But I have seen um, women move, certainly Stephanie's a, a, you know, kind of a manifestation of that, where she's now the CEO. But as I mentioned, I've seen you know, women move into the directorships at our sites and certainly, you know, other sites across the country. Um, you know, they're, they're the head of the AASLH program at, at, the, at the national conference this year. So they're taking, they are, they are stepping into leadership roles that are visible. They're not, you know, necessarily just behind the scenes as well. So it's, it's, it is heartening. It's very heartening. We are. I'm, I'm seeing that all over. I will also say that Cindy gave me my first job out of graduate school. 
So let me just say thank you very much. <laughs> a thousand years ago in Coronado, California. So yeah, that was. We like uh, to talk about Haley and diapers as we're exactly. doing an exhibit and all those good things. She's so, now in college. You know that's so. the great thing about women, right? You know, you know what you're going. You know what you know what you're going through. Exactly. Be supportive. Libby, when we talked a little bit ago, you specifically talked about um, cable, the cable industry, and. Um, uh, the History Channel in particular, and you were talking about how it's such a great emerging professional um, space for women. Maybe you could tell everyone a little bit about that, because I was very intrigued by that, because I didn't, I didn't make that connection right away. Well, um, when I went to graduate school, I was studying history. I did not worry about whether there was room for women in history. That seemed like that was a, a there were lots of women in academics, not as many as men, but there, there was room there, and I taught history at Long Island University for a few years. And then A&E announced they were going to start a new network called, they weren't sure, but it was going to be about history. So I sent in my resume and I got the job, which is very nice. Um, and, and, but I didn't think, gee, what are they, are there, are there opportunities for women there? Because <clears throat> when I first visited the network, there were a lot of women. They were in senior, they were SVPs, um, they were programmers, and women who worked in production, and different types of jobs. There were no women over in engineering, um, and in the cable companies, those are the people who bring the signal to you, um, very few women in senior management at that time. But in television, um, it, television is a little bit like publishing, in that there, there has been a place for women there for a long time. And so our CEO for years, um, Abby Raven, who uh, just recently retired, and she, uh, as a president and CEO, guided the company, helped grow it. It was very, very formative for the company. And then she has been, the new CEO is a woman named Nancy Dubuque. And um, she's a dynamo. She's about 45. Um, and and is really taking these whole networks to exciting places. But more interesting than just, I think, more interesting than just the sort of at the CEO level is the amount of opportunity for women to go from, to climb up in the company and go into senior management. So I think that television actually has been a pretty welcoming space for women for a long time. Um, and I didn't fight any battles. The one battle that I saw among my friends was when we were growing up, women seemed to me to feel like they had to dress more like men mm -hmm. so that they wore suits and they wore, remember those things? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're like bow tie, or really? And, um, and now in television, women come to work dressed more like, like, like I am or, you know, in, but much more casually. And that's something you, that's very generational. And it's interesting to me that the uh, um, flexibility for how women present themselves professionally has really widened. Excellent. Bridget, so uh, talking about empowerment for girls, mm -hmm. maybe you could jump in here and talk a little bit about um, what you're seeing as far as your programs and how you're seeing the, because um, you've been with Girl Scouts now for quite a, quite a long time, yeah. maybe you could talk a little bit about the change in programs or, as you said earlier, um, <laughs> science, technology, and certainly economic empowerment for young women and economic knowledge is very important. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how the difference between when you were a Girl Scout versus these new younger Girl Scouts today and the types of programs that you're trying to put out for them. Oh, that's great. Um, and everything I love to talk about. Uh, one of the things that we really emphasize on a national level and on a local level is, is STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And we're actually entering into a pretty significant maker program with the maker philosophy of hands-on learning for STEAM. Um, nationally, also, there's a, a large focus with Girl Scouts on, as you said, economic empowerment. Financial literacy, as I mentioned, the cookie business is probably our best known program that addresses that. And every time you see those cute little girls selling cookies outside your grocery store, they're learning a very valuable lesson about how to run a business and how to budget and how to manage. And we, we educate those girls that when they're selling their cookies, when they're setting their goals, that they have something that they're planning for. They're not just selling to sell. They're selling because they have said, we need to sell 3,000 boxes in order to be able to achieve this goal of going to this trip. 
Um, I think that emphasis, that emphasis on the planfulness, on really looking at what skills the cookie program brings is one of the biggest changes I've seen in my 10 years with Girl Scouts. I think also the emphasis on non-traditional careers has increased a lot. Um, and I, listening to you talk about television, I'm now very excited about thinking how I can share that with girls. One of, and I think the emphasis on career preparation is something that we've done as well. Uh, I'm working right now with um, a group of women to give an, give an educational program to girls about careers in building, the building industry, um, both from careers you might not think about, like the legal careers, but also careers in construction, to kind of look across the board. And we're hoping to get a hard hat tour for girls. So I think getting that kind of look at all of the possibilities is what we're really trying to do with Girl Scouts. Excellent. Excellent. Forgive me, I'm taking notes, because I knew this was going to be a fantastic panel, and I don't want to forget any of this. Let me switch gears a little bit, and Ida, if I can turn this to you. So academia is um, an interesting institution for in its own right. So Howard University is, of course, um, the oldest organization of any of us sitting here. But maybe you could talk a little bit about what drew you to it, and then if you feel like it is... Um, if, if it has been successful at bringing more young women in or if there are things you could do to be more successful? Well, that's a good synergy, and thank you for that question because I have a California as well as a young woman's uh, point to make. We have Kamala Harris out in California right now, the first African-American attorney general for the state of California, Howard alum. So she's representing a lot of possibilities in that field, running at political and using the synergy of a law background. On campus right now, we have a group called Women as Change Agents, or WACA, or WACA, whichever one you prefer. And what we have sought to do was really kind of harmonize our freshmen to our seniors or graduate students, as well as our janitorial to our senior administrators, to come together in, quote, a safe space to discuss women's issues and to kind of learn that we're three-dimensional. We do our work, but we're not our work. So the janitor is doing that job. She is not a janitor. She's not a mop. She is actually a human being who has other opportunities. So we find a lot of conversation about knitting, sewing, bungee jumping, really kinds of obscure and very fascinating talents. So the Women is Change Agents group has actually met and harmonized our students, faculty, and staff collectively as well as individually. We had a workshop last semester with our <coughs> faculty, and we have six women deans in the various professional schools, and that has never happened before. And Lisa Fenwick, if I might say this on uh, TV, well, I've said it already, uh, did kind of advocate for a female president, to see a female president at the helm of Howard University. We did have a temporary woman, Joyce Ladner, at one time during the, I guess, mid 2000s or maybe the 90s. It's all a big yesterday for me. But nevertheless, um, kind of helping our students understand the possibilities. We've always been female majority on the campus of Howard University, but we don't represent ourselves in the senior administration in that level. So to reflect the demographic as it is presented is what our concern is, or to harmonize those two pools. So we're seeing that happen with our generation of Kamala Harris's and other individuals like that. Excellent. And so are you seeing, what are the numbers that you're seeing as far as, um, as far as the younger generations? Are you seeing? We are almost 65% female really? student population in our undergraduate program and the student women students had concern about student leadership the university not university Howard University Student Association has been predominantly male led so the girls got together and created a synergy to say how do we get ourselves elected mm -hmm. how do we vote not just the person but the issues and see beyond the popularity of you know big man on campus type kind of thing. Not to deride the men in their campaigns as being frivolous, but simply to see how would you want your issues, whether it's safety or the idea of any kind of issue that might affect the student. Safety is a huge issue, both physical safety and buddying up, walking to and from the library. Mm -hmm. So they came together and they actually hold this workshop. So successful generations of former student presidents came back and administered how to win. And these girls are kind of passing on this baton in organized forms and sessions and mimicking this behavior and mentoring each other. So we're seeing our students, our faculty, and our staff in various pools do that. And I think it's very good to have that conversation because at times there is some competition between women for whatever reason, whether it's real or imagined. You know, if I might admire your brooch and I want it and I can't have it, I must deride you for that. Or, you know, I like her <laughs> shoes, but I can't fit them. So, yeah. so we always kind of find a way with which to, to nitpick. And once we see that we're divided, we lose the, the capacity to really be successful. Mm -hmm. So I think our young women have come to understand that that's necessary. There is a need to kind of put aside some personal issues and come together and see yourself as a, a rising adult mm -hmm. and coming together. And I've seen that happen on yeah. our student campus. And taking your place. That's excellent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You want to replace yourself. Exactly. Excellent. So Nancy, one of the things that you and I had been talking about, we coming from both, of course, um, 
suffrage, former suffrage organizations, historic suffrage associations, we've been talking for a couple of years now and saying, you know, hey, this anniversary is coming up and we should really, you know, put our heads together and figure something out because as the two organizations that were there and are still around, we should, we should probably come up with something and, and make sure that we're, we're talking to each other. Um, but one of the things that I found fascinating when you and I were talking just very recently is that you had talked about um, the fact that it is the League of Women Voters, but that you have changed the way that you um, are seeking out um, and finding new ways to enfranchise different groups. And it's not just women. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about that because I think that's a very interesting component to the League that at least I didn't realize right off the bat and probably some other people haven't as well. Sure. Well, just as a, a brief um, comment before that, um, as I said, we were founded to help educate women on the issues. Well, after about 50 years, we realized that the men weren't too well educated on the issues either. <laughs> so we shifted our focus there, and we, uh, and we actually, men can be members, so all of you men uh, can feel free to join. Uh, so we are still pri primarily a women's organization, but men can be members, and we actually had one man on the, on the board recently. So we have these numbers going a different way. But what we have certainly uh, focused on always, but particularly, I would say, in these last 10 years, um, is a real focus on underrepresented populations in the American electorate. And ever since, of course, so much more attention was put on American elections uh, in the 2000 election. And there's been federal legislation and a lot of state legislation. All sorts of changes are going on. And frankly, we're concerned that a number of those uh, trends are not going in the right direction. So we have increased our emphasis on what we generally call voter protection. So it's very important to us that the American electorate look, the voting, so the electorate, voters, look as much like America as possible so that they can elect representatives at all levels who reflect their views and therefore policies uh, would uh, emanate that would be consistent with those views. So we do quite a bit on all of those issues. Uh, the National League works closely with 27 state leagues uh, at the state legislative level, uh, fighting some of these laws in some cases, uh, suing in some cases. Uh, we are supporting um, as actively as we can um, ways to improve the Voting Rights Act after the recent uh, Shelby decision by the Supreme Court. So we've taken the notion of what was, and of course, during the, the last century where the civil rights issues and then young people getting the vote, uh, the League was you know, concerned with all of those things. But because all of America, I think, thought that our, and, and Americans do tend to think that our election system is the best in the world, and certainly there is, I'm not going to argue with anybody about, about the, the quality of the American democracy in general, but in fact our election system, uh, because it's so decentralized, does allow for or has been allowing for some manipulation that we feel has, has disenfranchised certain populations, uh, including young people uh, and people of color and, and lower income people. So that is a major concern of ours and that is where a lot of our current work is focused. Excellent, excellent. So um, switching gears just a little bit, I want to talk, I want to start talking about partnerships, collaborations, um, and different ways that we can expand our network. I, I happen to think that women are particularly um, adept at this. Um, we tend to have a Rolodex in our head, or at least I know all of you do, I'm positive, and I know I do. And so I try to go through and think, well, who, who are some of those people that we could be reaching out to? Um, one of the things that I think has um, stymied a lot of organizations is this stovepipe theory. So you get so, um, you get so wrapped up in talking to yourself all of the time and you don't really branch out and hear what others are saying and try to, try to figure out what some of those um, intersections are between what you do. So maybe we could talk a little bit about that and also are there any interesting collaborations that you all are coming up with? Um, or that you think, not just for 2020 and suffrage, but for moving the organizations forward. There's certainly a lot of symmetry here, but let's talk a little bit about a little outside of those boundaries that we may normally have. I will start by saying, Cindy, um, you're with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, 
and I um, am with Sewell Belmont House, but I also sit on the board of directors for the National Collaboration for Women's History Sites. And the National Trust and the National Collaborative are entering into a memo of understanding very in coming days and coming weeks, because as the National Trust is moving forward with this new initiative of National Treasures, it wants to make sure that women's history is told at all of the sites possibly as possible. So it's not just those that are named for women's history or women themselves, but there are women's stories at every, like you pointed out, at every at every site. Mm -hmm. I think that's a particularly wonderful partnership that we're going through, mm -hmm. but maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the others, because I know that the National Trust has 20, I'm not going to remember, 23, 26, 25, 25, 25. Um, mm -hmm. different nationwide partnerships and, and, and different sites. Different sites. Well, the, the National Treasures program that you mentioned is um, the primary strategic focus of the National Trust which is to kind of expand expand our, our nationwide reach uh, uh, beyond the 25 sites that we either own or operate. Um, and so we've recently entered into conversations with the, with the National Collaborative to think about um, expanding that National Treasures portfolio to um, not only geographically, but also to think about um, women's issues, women places where there was significant women's history. Um, and particularly around um, education and interpretation. So I, I, I look forward to hearing more how you know how that progresses. And um, the National Collaborative is also is obviously of, of women's historic sites is an important is an important place for the National Trust to reach to reach out to because even though it is a nationwide portfolio that we have, as a, you know, a twenty or twenty five is not is is not huge. Um, but I mentioned the the Wilson House and 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 the Woodrow Wilson House and the work that um, that Bob has been doing with you and with other with um, you know with other 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 women's sites. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about at Decatur House when um, you know I actually was doing research at the Spring Arn and and looking into um, you know is, what what kind of research and, and and archives and documents you all had. So all of our sites have the opportunity and do um, reach out within their own communities or even across um, you know, disciplines. I'm thinking about our site um, in Charlottesville or in Orange at, at Montpelier where they hold naturalization um, ceremonies uh, at Montpelier and also at the Lower East Side Tenement in New York City. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of opportunity to, to, um, to think about outside of just like the, the four walls or you know, the man the man, um, and, and we're doing that in a lot of different places. Ida, maybe you could expand a little bit. One of the concepts that you brought up um, uh, right in your beginning remarks were, was that we certainly had a rocky start to suffrage. And certainly suffrage and, and the National Woman's Party, of course, was largely a middle class white woman's organization, absolutely. Um, so much so that when we give tours of the Sewell Belmont House, one of my favorite questions to ask is particularly of school groups that comes through is, you know, there's a lot of pictures up on the wall. Who don't you see? And why do you suppose they're not here? And it's a great way to start the conversation because, again, it's, um, it's about telling the honest story about where there was difficulty, and difficulty often um, springs back and forth. It's not just something that is in the history books. It is certainly something that we see all over America even today. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about that and then Give me some advice as we go forward to 2020. Who are some of those organizations I should be reaching out to that I might not be? And I don't want to make that same mistake. Well, you have me on your Rolodex. So that's I do. A good start. <laughs> uh, in regards to uh, my, my panelists mentioning the, the National Trust, and we've actually had interns, I believe, with you from the public history program at Howard University. So that's very important. And we'd like to see our interns do more than just simply the grunt work, per se, mm -hmm. although they are undergraduates, and they kind of have to learn that they have to earn their way up the, the, the food chain, so to speak. But kind of bring your daughters to work day in that regard for our students. But to get back to your question, uh, Paige, uh, the concern to build collaboratives with, like, the Mary McLeod Bethune home. I know we did something with them last time. And I just finished a book on Mary McLeod Bethune where she was asked if she could live her life over again, what would she do? She said, run for Congress. 
She would go to New York and run for Congress. So, and she said, Adam Clayton Powell wouldn't have to worry about me because there's enough room for all of us. So I think that small vignette would really help you understand that even though there was some issue with coming together, whether it was the March for Women's Rights in 1913, we still kind of came together out of necessity as women to accomplish the goal. And um, in that regard, where you see the absence of certain images or certain faces, then we have to kind of find those names and add them. And Dr. Rosalind Torborg Penn has a new database out talking about black suffragettes. And I think it's over 1,600 either sites or what have you. I have to find the link for you. But she's an excellent person. And now that she's in her tertiary career, semi-retired, she'd be a very good human resource to uh, include, as well as some of your more actively involved, predominantly in historically black colleges, where they have programs that are trying to kind of link with these sites and have students working in that kind of literature. I also represent the Association of Black Women Historians, which is lay and professional historians. We would gladly love to collaborate with you to kind of help tease out some stories and or link our websites together so as we traffic each other kind of that way. I can't think of any one particular organization. Definitely this Black Women's Re Research Initiative I mentioned, Avis DeWeaver is on that, and she's an amazing researcher and scholar. So I think if we kind of link ourselves up as individuals, then we can all probably bring our organization with us. But definitely, I think we're going to have to coalesce over these issues because there are certain environmental issues and economic issues that affect all of us. And uh, at some point, we need to kind of acknowledge the, the elephant in the room, so to speak, but also kind of say, well, if the elephant grows too large, there'll be no room for us in the room. So we need to find a way to kind of either, you know, move the elephant into a smaller space or what have you. So definitely, um, I, th I couldn't find a better visual with which to, <laughs> to give that uh, vignette, but um, I mean, environmental justice is huge. Um, the toxic waste issues are huge. And so we need to kind of find these issues that really affect all of us, e economics, education, and even military, uh, people coming back from the military. Women are being recruited. They're coming back in pieces. They have post-traumatic stress. They're being assaulted. So we have to kind of look at a way to really ameliorate those conditions that affect all of us. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Let me, let me ask you, um, one, of the, one of the interesting things about this panel is that we're all coming from different areas. But I want to point out that, um, that Libby and certainly the History um, Channel and A&E Network has been a wonderful supporter of not only um, the programming that you all obviously do, but also smaller sites around the country. Um, she mentioned just very casually the wonderful um, small uh, five-minute film that History Channel did for us, but that was, you know, that was a game changer for us. The Sewell Belmont House has an operating budget of about $500,000 a year. This is not a lot of money, but a $50,000, $60,000 in-kind gift from somebody like History Channel makes a significant difference. And those are the types of partnerships that you, that I'm happy to have you um, be a part of with us because it really moves us forward. But you also do far more than just the little bit that I've talked about with us. There are many, many organizations that you support. And really, that is, it is going to take those types of partnerships. It's not just nonprofit to nonprofit and sharing and, and resources and Rolodexes and that sort of thing, but it's actually going to take partnerships that go across from nonprofit to for profit so that we can move these stories forward. Maybe you could take just a minute and spotlight a few of the other ones that you've worked on. Um, well. National Trust. Uh, National right Trust. We've done a lot of work with the National Trust. Um, we've done a lot of work, um, for example, at the Statue of Liberty. Since Sandy, they really have to limit, the Park Service has to limit how many people can go up the Statue of Liberty. Um, so we were um, offered to produce a video for them so that people can experience what it's like to go up the the um, statue and what the view was like, as well as tell the story um, and include infographics and get people excited about Because a lot of people want to know, how tall is it? How long did it take to build? What were the French doing anyway, giving us a statue? You know, things like that. So <laughs> we put it together. We try to keep it compelling and engaging, um, but also share a history story. And we work closely with the curators um, to make sure that we are addressing issues that they face with, the, with, their, with their visitors. So it's um, a, lot, a lot of fun. But one of the things I'm going to, can I just talk about the, a couple of years ago when I was um, at the annual luncheon at Sewell Belmont House, I spoke about what a, what a great um, opportunity we have in the next six years to build a women's history discovery trail. And, work in different, they can, 
you know, there's a wonderful black history discovery trail, there's a civil war discovery trail, but you could do them regionally, you could do, the, I mean, I could imagine starting at Seneca Falls and coming down, you know, stop at the Clara Barton House, go to Sewell Belmont, stay and visit your congressman or senator while you're here, woman, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, I can't name all the sites, I, would, I don't know them, but the idea of linking them thematically would make, you know, great, great um, intergenerational road trip. I mean, you know, Thelma, Louise, and Grandma, <laughs> right? You want, I, I, I think that would be wonderful. And before I came here tonight, my daughter called me and um, she said, you know, Mom would be so happy you were talking on a panel about women's equality. And I thought, I was just really um, thinking my daughter's about to get married. I thought, maybe someday. She and I and whoever will get in the car and do the Women's Discovery um, Trail. I just think it would be a nice opportunity. There are so many stories out there that um, you said, you know, you weren't sure history, but you love stories. Well, David McCullough always says, the best history is based on great stories. And women's history has wonderful stories to share. And I think making them um, more available, more top of mind, and uniting them, because there's lots of information out there on websites. Right. League of Women's Voter has great history to share with um, the public, but also with students, with people looking. National History Day, we can, we can unite this. And God knows the collection here at the National Archives is a gold mine of riches. I know I'm jumping all over the place, but I'm saying there are wonderful stories, and people don't know them. And it's really important that we collect the information and get it out there. That's one of the wonderful things about an anniversary like a centennial because it raises the visibility of a topic and it gives you a platform to really reach out to the public in, in a new and exciting way. Absolutely. Well, I think um, we've discovered another, what do you think, 10, 15 things to go on our to-do list, right. respectively, I think, um, at least. I have all of my notes because I'll be following up with everybody when we're done. So I think it's probably a good opportunity for us to open it up to audience questions and comments. And it's not just, as I said, it's not just questions, it's please talk about comments. Is there a, a particular women's history site or story that you find very compelling that you think maybe others haven't even seen or enough people haven't seen? Um, is there a way for you all, is there something within the programming of our various organizations that you would like to talk about, ask questions about, um, and again, just make comments for? So there are microphones on either side of the aisle. Please just help yourself, and um, we'll let the we'll let the first one. How about he seems like he was faster to the microphone, so I'm going <laughs> to let him go first. Yeah, I'm John Wetmore from Maryland. Uh, League of Women Voters in Maryland has made uh, gerrymandering and redistricting reform as one of their priorities. Uh, how has gerrymandering affected women voters and women candidates over the years? Well, hmm. as, as you may know, because you sound knowledgeable about it, gerrymandering, which is, you know, the, the contorting how the districts are, are drawn in the states, um, is, is usually done to protect the incumbent politicians. So, and both parties do the same to the extent that they can control it. So, we're in general, the leagues around the country are trying, are pushing for reforms in the process so that we have a system where the voters get to pick their politicians instead of the politicians picking their voters, which is sort of how it is now when you draw the lines. Uh, women do extremely well uh, in races uh, when they're running for an open seat. When they are running for an open seat at any level, they win at the same rate as men. Um, of course, there are more, most elections actually are incumbents running and it's always harder to beat an incumbent, particularly when they've drawn these lines so that all of their supporters are kind of based right around them. So there are fewer and fewer competitive seats in the United States Congress than there used to be. So in general, that is going to hurt women who, who, will, who have even a harder time than men raising the money and so forth to challenge an incumbent. So the more you protect the incumbents, the harder it will be in most cases for women to win. But thank you for asking. That's a good political question. Very. And right over here. My name is Ms. Louisa Hayward Holden. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. And I want to thank you for your wonderful discussion tonight. It's very enlightening. 
and um, just share that I'm in Washington from Massachusetts because my son, who I bore, is kidnapped, and um, I'm being violated, my constitutional and civil rights, and it's been covered up for 12 years, and he's been kidnapped from Boston to Massachusetts and then internationally to Great Britain, and the cover-up emanated from Washington. I just want to note three things, that it wasn't my congresswoman or a man that helped me at all, and it wasn't the president's or the FBI director as I'm a witness to the felonies. It's actually one person at the U.S. Supreme Court, the Chief Justice Roberts, who seems to have the most heart in Washington that I might make women's history, that paternity going forward has to be proven. And I just want you to know that women's suffrage hasn't ended. I've been thrown in jail. I've been sent to mental hospitals and drugged unlawfully. And it's been horrendous. I'm lucky that I'm still alive. And it's still going on today that these people were so malvolent to cover it up and spin me as some crazy woman in this day and age is astonishing to me. It's just alarming and shocking. So last, I just want to say, when I hear you talk, um, I hope in these next few years that you're going to broaden um, women's suffrage and this marked history to not only voting rights, but women and their bodies and their rights, as well as the right to work. My grandmother started a library at Princeton University. It's called the Merriam Young Holden Library. And um, I'm so proud of her. She put together a collection of books and pamphlets and that when the suffragists spoke at Seneca Falls, they wrote what they were speaking about and what women wanted. And she got those pamphlets and preserved them in the rare book division at Firestone Library at Princeton University. And I hope in the future, once I get my matter settled and my son back, to start a um, speaker series at her library about women's issues and how society is changing and continue her work. Because what I've learned is education and sharing is so important. And not only to take what we've learned from the past, but also to think outside the box, beyond what we normally, the way we normally think. Don't ever think that your thinking is wrong, that you actually could be right with one very simple idea, and it might astound people, and yet it might be a breakthrough for all of us. Mm -hmm. So I really want to thank you for sharing what you're going to be doing, because it sounds wonderful. And I think it's so important that we share with one another. And I think there's great opportunities ahead of us. So um, I don't really have a question other than I hope that um, if I ask you, will you think about giving all the people that are coming to your historical sites or League of Women Voters, if you can give out little certificates to people that they can hang on their walls. And it's like an educational course when they go to these events you're going to be planning. Because when they go home and they put that on the wall and more people see it and it marks the time and place, I think it will be best for all of us not only presently, but going forward. Do you Thank think you, so you could much. do that? Thank you think so about much. that it, idea. There are, I've had many ideas pop into my head since you, since you started your comments. And I want to thank you absolutely, as I'm sure the rest of the panelists appreciate it as well. You, you, you have um, a remarkable story. And I'm so happy that you were here tonight and that could have your voice and make sure that that story, or at least in this small um, audience, has a little bit, got a little bit of, of voice for you tonight as we move forward. You are exactly right in that all of the history organizations and different sites that are out there all have contemporary stories that go into them. It's not just about Alice Paul, Lucy Burns, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The, you know, the list is long of these wonderful women who did all of this amazing work for suffrage not to mention just the ones that go unnamed that we simply mm. don't know. And it wasn't just something that happened 100 years ago. All of these sites and all of these stories that we have and are privileged to tell every day really do make an impact on policy today, 
on how we educate not only young people as they come through, but also um, grown-ups or women that are in their 40s and 50s have come through Sewell Belmont all the time and they say to me, oh my word, I never knew. How did I go all the way through graduate school and this was never presented to me? How did I not know this? How did my mother not know this? I'm making sure that my daughter knows this. So thank you very much for making sure that you shared that with us. And it also, of course, gives us all um, something else to add to our to-do list, not to make it light, but that we also absolutely need to keep those courageous current stories yes. in our heads as well. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for sharing. Hello. Um, I am a... Uh, volunteer with Smithsonian, uh, including American History, which is planning a um, centennial exhibit. And of course, I will be giving a copy of the program tonight to the curators. I know them. Um, so hopefully, they will be contacting you uh, related to the exhibit, uh, which of course will be seen by millions of people uh, starting in 2020. Uh, but my other uh, comment was one of the um, Smithsonian programs. We actually have a lot of programs that feature uh, women, and one that I took my niece to, because I think it's important to include young people, uh, I took her to see uh, Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor at a um, Smithsonian program. I also took her to see uh, Bader Ginsburg, but uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, a uh, very gracious lady, and she said, of course, that when she was the first uh, female Supreme Court Justice, and she had to change robes in the ladies' room because they didn't have a uh, changing room for females since she was the first one. And so the uh, attorneys who would come in uh, to present their cases to the court would be going into the ladies' room and seeing <laughs> the judge changing into her robes. So I just thought that was funny when the uh, restroom was mentioned at UVA. Uh, my niece was, of course, completely outraged that uh, Sandra Day O'Connor had to go to the ladies' room to change into her judge robes. Um, but of course, after Bader Ginsburg came, um, of course, then they, they have a, uh, uh, their own changing room, which now it's the same size as the men's, so it's very nice. <laughs> um, but I was just, uh, basically, I was just going to mention that um, I think it will be nice. Uh, I'm going to talk to our uh, curators, um, because I think it would be very helpful, especially about minority women and the League of Women Voters. Uh, definitely want those to be in our exhibit. It's going to be seen by by millions and millions of people. Of course, right on the mall, it's one of the top museums in the world, So, or most visited. I don't know if you say top, but one of the most visited museums in the world. So we definitely, um, this was a good program, and I'm going to share it along with the uh, link for the uh, film. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll also say that there are there are some materials, collateral materials, that were put out in the main lobby right here. Um, there's a table, and if you don't if you don't see something that you wanted or a reference that somebody has made, my business cards are out there. Please grab one and shoot me a quick email, and I'd be happy to um, ping somebody and find out exactly what it was, or find the link or something else so that we could share it. Yeah, may I, I just yep. like to respond? Um, I think. Once you start thinking about how the built environment reflects access, it gives you a new way of looking at historic places or what we've experienced in our life. And you were talking about the changing rooms for, at the Supreme Court, and I was talking about the bathrooms, the law school, the UVA. But think about handicapped access. That was something that's still an issue. When you go to other countries, a lot of countries do not provide handicapped access. And if um, for for any of you who've ever been on crutches, you have a new appreciation for what um, you find in, our, in, in many public buildings in America. That, that ease of access makes a big difference with that sloping curve. Yeah. Um, the whole idea of kitchens being set apart from the house. You know, we say, well, we didn't want the heat in the main house in the south. You want, but really what you do, you don't want to see the people who are cooking. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and in the big houses, mm -hmm. you want, you know, that was the, serv the kitchen was in the servant's wing. Um, it means we don't want to see the cook. Today you have an open plan. I um, have a book coming out on the history of food in, in the United States. And one of the things you see when you, when, as you go through American history is how the kitchen is laid out to make it more inclusive. So all of these things are relevant to the way we understand history. 
we just don't train ourselves to look at built environments um, statement, the way, what they're telling us about the role of the people within the houses, but the National Trust is, a, is an expert at, at that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Do we have time for two more quick questions? Let's, right here. Hi, good evening. I'm Diana Bailey, and I'm the Managing Director of the Maryland Women's Heritage Center, which is housed in Baltimore. And we really appreciate your comments, particularly from the national level, but for those of us that are in a state um, that may or may not have access to some of the national resources or collaborations or whatever, what are some things that perhaps we can do for those of us in a state that are trying to pr uh, promote women's history in our state, but also the policy shifts and the education for students and adults? Because um, we're trying to do it again at, at the, the level, at the local level, at the community level. Right. I'll, yeah, I'll jump in. Talk yeah. to your local Girl Scout Council. <laughs> <laughs> of course. That's great to hear. Yes. Girl Scouts of Central Maryland is wonderful. Girl Scouts of Chesapeake Bay. I'll give a little shout out to my own organization, mm -hmm. Girl Scouts of Nation's Capital. Um, you we know, have many visitors, Girl Scouts that come to our center right. and do some of the STEM exhibits, hearing, hearing your STEM thing. So we're trying to reinforce that career preparation for girls. Wonderful, so thank you. Most of it needs, what my biggest need is, frankly, is resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, human resources, but also fiscal resources, just like the national. Mm -hmm. So any support ideas for that would be very welcomed. I, I, would, I would bet that your you know, sites near your locale would be delighted to have you. And, and, and most of these places will charge nothing or a nominal fee. So. It, Getting people, getting your young people to the places, to these places, might be might be your only your only expense. But you know, our experience is that um, you know the strength of these sites really comes from the from the local communities. I mean, from you know, coming on high, the national level, it, it, you're going to find really wonderful places that want to share your local history um, in in your area. And I know they'd be delighted to have you. And and often they're. You know, there's there's small staff, so they have small capacity, but that's why they're there, and they're passionate about it, and they want to share. And um, so I, I can't imagine that they they wouldn't be interested in um, opening literally their front right. door. We have some partnerships with the heritage areas, and but again, they're in this sort of the same situation we mm. are. But they are again great partners. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. My name is Carmen Delgado Voto, and I'm also involved with the uh, Maryland Women's Heritage Center and Vision 2020. And I have uh, two or three comments on some of the things that you have said tonight. Uh, I'd like to know if the archives as an institution has a plan for celebrating the uh, uh, anniversary of, of suffrage. Uh, the second thing is to suggest that um, in order to get momentum and get people interested in celebrating something that happened such a long time ago, we need to sort of have a, a national calendar of what different people may be doing. And I, I'm not quite sure which organization would be the right one to do that. But it's very important that we do censuses on different things that pertain to women. The Department of Interior was doing uh, a um, not scientific census, but trying to collect information as to how many women were honored in some way in the states. And they were engaging women's organizations into sending information. And if they have been to a place where the woman has been honored, to take a picture and send it to them so that they can accumulate that kind of information. I think that would give a lot of fuel, particularly for the young people. And to misstate, um, uh, I was uh, on the advisory committee to that first uh, League of Women Voters uh, 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 participation in the debates. And I thought that was the greatest thing the league had done up to that moment. But uh, it would be also very interesting to have something that says, okay, we got suffrage on such and such a date, mm -hmm. and all the little things that women have done to really make elections 
um, uh, really viable mm -hmm. because we were the ones that served as election judges. We were the ones that distributed all the uh, literature for parties outside the polls. We were the ones that really encouraged registration mm -hmm. and all the things that we did, it would be great to have a, 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 a program that said, you know, we used to do things with uh, machines that uh, the young people haven't seen. Uh, we <laughs> used to communicate with people the hard way, calling everybody. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so that people um, don't think that the years, the 100 years have been followed. Exactly. That women have been an integral part of the electoral system, right. doing little things that have made voting uh, a privilege that uh, many of us have uh, yeah. as a habit. Carmen, you're, uh, you're exactly that right. We need to create that habit yeah. because in the United States, we still 35% is a very good turnout, and that's I know. not right. Well, we still have a ways to go. I think you're absolutely right. And I would certainly hope, I, I don't think I can answer all of your questions, but I certainly hope that um, conversations like this are a good place for us to start. And I think you're exactly right. Suffrage was just a means to an end. It was one part of it. And then there was you know, 100 years worth of work that's happened since then. And certainly, as we've discovered, not discovered tonight, but mentioned tonight, that there are plenty of other things that we, as women, are interested in, that we want to learn about, that we want to educate ourselves, and that we want to make sure that we're telling those stories of the women that we just, again, aren't at the tip of our tongues, most definitely. Well, and I certainly hope that as we move forward, that um, uh, use of technology, certainly social media, you know, online websites, Diana mentioned, you know, how do, how do small places find new resources? I think that online content, which is um, certainly not free, but it is a lot more inexpensive than trying to do a, a program or write a book or produce a film or some of those things that are just out of reach. So I think we're probably out of time. So let me say on behalf of the rest of the panelists, thank you all very much for your comments and for being here tonight. And we are, of course, delighted to be a part of the archive programming. Um, and we hope that we will see you back for Women's History Month, um, March 2015. Thank you all very much. Thank you.